Mr. Sherman, you've done many performances of the, this complete cycle of the Liszt Etudes. I think I've heard one of the very first many years ago. How have they changed in your mind since, uh, since you first played them all? They're very uh, individual, characteristic pieces. And uh, I have the inclination, kind of the mischief, to always try things in different ways. But as a matter of conception, I don't think they really have changed very much because uh, their intrinsic nature is so powerful, so strong, or relentless, and so difficult, uh, and so difficult. So one is just happy to survive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, I certainly understand that. And obviously, not only uh, you've had a, a distinguished career playing these pieces a lot, but you've no doubt have taught them a lot. Uh, to many generations of students, uh, does the process of teaching some of these particularly difficult works and, and pieces like Mazeppa and Fofolé, uh, have that, has that changed how you play them? <coughs> Confession. After Liszt, it was considered uh, unforgivable when you played in the master class of Liszt to propose a piece which was the specialty of the master. You were not allowed to. Now, I never quite had that sense of importance to think I have specialties, but there are certain pieces that are impossible for me to teach, like Obus 109 of Beethoven. And actually, rarely have I taught this. I have a student who uh, has performed and used the Mazeppa in various competitions just within the last year. And when he plays, I, I sort of go like that, or go out of the room, <laughs> or <clears throat> it, it, it's just very hard for me to, to hear them, just because I'm so intimate. And, um, and I think it's very uh, easy to go wrong and go off when you hear somebody else play them. You kind of get attached to your own obsession with the music, and to have that appropriate objectivity. Oh, that's interesting. Why don't you do that? Or why don't you try that? So I've kind of uh, avoided, in a way actually kind of similar to my teacher Steuermann, who was <coughs> disciple of Schoenberg, played the first performance of all Schoenberg piano music, would not teach me Schoenberg. He said, that's your music. You take care of it. You know? So uh, these etudes, they're personal. I took on the task that other people take on the task. It's very difficult for me to teach them, so I don't really have much experience. I mean, there really are sort of two ways, two schools of thought about teaching uh, piano or teaching any musical instruments, it seems to me. There's, the, there's a kind of an older idea that you imitate the master and that, that certainly one has the sense in the 19th century that, that that often people would sort of sit at the feet of the master and try to try to imitate exactly what the master is doing. You're obviously seeing yourself as a, as a uh, in a very different way that you are setting off the imagination and and you want your students to fly with what they can conceive of about this music. And so I suppose it's difficult with you with these pieces that you have been identified with for so many years to to teach them. But in a way, they do with the Chopin etudes constitute the piano technique of the 19th century. And, uh, and I would think that, uh, that, you, that you must at least use parts of these etudes to show how far the piano can go. I mean, I, I certainly, in my studies of these pieces, always felt that this was as, as, as extreme as, as a technical demand could, was ever made in the 19th century, and the Chopins too. Could you actually t talk to us about the, the Chopin versus the Liszt? Two different philosophies. For Chopin, there were ten fingers. Each one had an individual soul and personality. For Liszt, the ten fingers comprised one hand, a completely unified technique where the equality and the evenness was considered a priori essential before you could maneuver 
into the qualities and vagaries of the music, Chopin built in to the performance the idea that uh, the fingers had their own characteristics. I actually, in, in the book that I wrote, Piano Pieces, made the following statement, <clears throat> because I thought I had seen it someplace, that Chopin considered the fourth finger the agent of the cantabile tone. And I wrote that down, and it was passed along in the book and also some excerpts in the Times. And there was a, a woman who saw this excerpt and started writing letters to the publisher, to the Times. Chopin never said any such thing. I knew every single word, and that's crazy and impossible. And I would get these letters, and then I tried strenuously to find, I'm very bad with attributions, actually. I kind of remember things and then just jot them down and they sort of fall into patterns. And I swear that I'd seen that someplace. And if he didn't say it, he it's still true. <laughs> yes. He should have, absolutely. Because everybody knows the fourth finger is a problem. Right. It's just a problem, you know. So one way you can handle it is either to sort of dismiss it as a weakling and say, well, just, we'll give you a little time to fit in there and we won't put too much pressure on you, or to build up its ego and say, no, you are the, the singing finger, and right. so we're going to put some uh, space around you and some fabric and drapery and so forth and give you a chance to sound, and it kind of compensates a little bit for this built-in weakness of the finger. But maybe it's also, I mean, I think that it's not that Liszt doesn't demand cantabile also, but it always seemed to me that, that, that Liszt's model, I mean, as pianists, we can only intimate something. We can't actually say it, and that we are looking to be, it seems to me, an orchestra in Liszt and a singer in, in uh, Chopin. And it seems to me that, that that very classical and, and transparent sound of, of many of the Chopin etudes is a very kind of vocal Thing. Well, you know, you said, listen to great singers if you want right. to play the piano. Um, I'm sure Liszt would have said the hand, same thing, too. Some famous conductor, it might have been Joachim, Eugen Joachim, mm -hmm. said Chopin is the Bach of the 19th century, the counterpoint of textures. Yeah. The most characteristic in Chopin, bass note, staccato with pedal, contradiction in terms. Right but it means a sound which penetrates, which rings, but which does not cover. And it moves in and out of the sonority, and it starts to create this conversation amongst the textures. So there's a counterpoint of lines and a counterpoint of textures. It's interesting that people who heard Liszt did not think of him as a vulgar exhibitionist, but always commented on the soul of his playing. But the entire canvas, of the piano and the 88 keys were there. And then the Liszt preoccupation with strange, interesting, and novel harmonies, and so the balances of the chords, and Chopin a more transparent texture to permit this counterpoint. But um, they do have different and uh, combining concepts that, as you say, comprehend But I think that you, you have to also look at the the two lives, I mean, what, what incredibly different lives they led. That, I mean, Liszt was the ultimate absorbing everything around him. He, had, he was incredibly traveled. He had dabbled in religion, in the ultimate carnality. He had gone to Italy and Switzerland. He had gone all over, not only with his tours, but just as, as uh, living. There's yeah. a sense that Chopin's not only music making, but his life was was cloistered, and his parameters were, on purpose, made small. Yes. That that he, I mean, obviously uh, he he had an interesting moving from Warsaw to Paris. But the, by the time he got to Paris, he really didn't leave very much, and his life was in those salons. And and I think nothing could be further the case. It seems to me uh, with Liszt. The problem they feel with Liszt, the, 
the ones who make judgments, is he didn't have enough time for composition, you know, right. because he was doing so many other things and so many uh, generous and and magnanimous things. And um, Felix Weingartner said the most decent of human beings, the most decent, giving himself to the music of other well, composers. Well, and when he was in Weimar, the, the amount of premieres of of composers who were either hostile to him or at least certainly not in his school. For instance, the Schumanns were very hostile to, to, to Liszt, and yet he gave uh, premieres of many big Schumann pieces and was very supportive. He learned orchestration rather late, I think, you know? But he and did yet the piano it. was yeah. an orchestra, and there are two kinds of pianists in the world. Forgive the platitude, <laughs> it's, it's absurd, we know. But the ones who play the piano is a piano, and the ones who play the piano is an orchestra. And, uh, you know, I grew up, and it's just the impulse that kids have and fall into, and I got a toy, which was cutouts of little cardboard characters from the orchestra. I remember, about the only thing I do remember at my age, from the, that youth assembling this orchestra, and the effect it had on me, and um, it seems my disposition always was the idea in the Listian sense that the piano was a substitute for the orchestra. I think actually Schnabel even felt that mm -hmm. as such. I mean, he, he said the violin is more characteristic, but it cannot sound like a clarinet. The clarinet cannot sound like a violin. But the piano can imitate both. Right. You know. And, this and is that's the what the piano does, yes. is, is imitate. And I remember one of the most memorable things that you ever said to me uh, about my playing was, don't sound like an orchestra. What you were meaning, what you were saying there, was not that that is not our model, but you were saying orchestras are too generalized. They don't really think to about each individual note enough. They don't, they don't have enough sense of the specificity of the piece, and so that I think it's it, there's. I hope contrast. I meant that because that sounds. That, no, that that sounds what you welcome. Yeah, yeah I think welcome. that's that's exactly. I believe right. in that, but it depends on the orchestra. Uh, of course, it, it depends does. on the orchestra, and the performance. Uh, two years ago, with really great happiness and pleasure, my wife and I played a two piano recital, celebrating thirty years of marriage. We played. Afternoon of a Fawn, DBC arrangement for two pianos. I heard some recordings. You know, I heard the modern recordings, all the important names. Then by accident I heard Stokowski, Philadelphia Orchestra. The oboe was up here, the slumbering, sliding strings were down there. Everything was detached and curving and fitting together in the most poetic and, and beautiful way. So maybe they had more time for rehearsals. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I think, in fact, what your comment to me was, don't sound like you've had two rehearsals, yeah. <laughs> which is what orchestras yeah. have these yeah. days, yeah. if they're lucky. Uh, because that is, that's, and I think, I, 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 certainly you as a pianist, that is, that is what I think of, of you, is someone who really thinks incredibly deeply and long about these pieces before you play them. And uh, the, the average orchestral music, musician does not have the privilege of, of spending You know, I grew up time. in the New Deal. And my father was a businessman, but unbelievably generous. And all the workers loved him, the bellboys and the barbers. And this kind of democratic impulse, an anti-hierarchical impulse, kind of spread into my bones and guts, and it meant everything had its place in the world, and everything had its majesty, and each note, and each piece, specific sui generis, and had to be um, discovered and rediscovered, and made uh, distinct, and every performance made distinct, you know. And that was a kind of um, the way I was raised, just the way I was raised, and of course, uh, my teacher. Um, you know, when I studied, which was an astonishing kind of 
good luck out of a horrible situation, the Second War, and the emigre Steuermann coming to New York. And I was 11 years old. He hadn't established his studio, his considerable and huge reputation in Europe, and so could afford to take on a young brat like, like me. But um, I learned, you know, many profound things. At that time, we used to speak about, in the world of music and piano, the touch of the pianist. Somehow that phrase has disappeared. I don't quite know why, but the touch, the sonority, the sound, the way it is modeled and shaped and made into something that uh, cannot be compared to anything else. And the piece was a grouping of these sounds according to its chemistry, its syndrome, its possibilities. But sonority and sound, um, and the way one used the pedal, for instance, was very important. Do you think that that a lot of that as the change is to do to the kind of the dominance of the microphone and the fact that we now get much more music from out of a loudspeaker than we do live. And that goes for not only a kid like I, I was a kid in Idaho and that's the way I heard all music. Oh, yeah. And that's the good side of it that I was able to hear the most sophisticated performances uh, on recordings of very difficult pieces in Lewiston, Idaho. But the fact is that even in big cities with surrounded by musicians, the younger generation is still getting most of their stuff from records, from, I'm dating myself, from CDs, from iPods, and so forth. No, I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. The microphone is uh, intolerant to the point of dictatorial and uh, refuses anything which exceeds the stylistic boundaries. And I think we're in a situation now that I would describe as the stylization of style. That style itself became a set of parameters and boundaries which cannot be exceeded without creating a furor, an uproar, and the audience does not understand that because it does not resemble the perfection of the CDs they have heard. A perfection which intrinsically is against the spirit of art and music. You know. And the style becomes almost tyrannical, doesn't it? It really, uh, because n no great piece of music, well, maybe Strauss waltzes or something are about style, but it seems that most music is not about style. The style is a way that they can say very difficult, ambiguous things. Yes. And I, and I just wonder if in most recordings that ambiguity, that sense that you should play loud but soft, fast but slow, <laughs> that kind of thing is very difficult to convey on a recording. Perhaps, you know. Uh, everything got stylized, everything got labeled, concentrated into short bursts of information and, and data. And um, what happened is the possibility of character and expression reduced itself to the strong emotions, the primary emotions and the more subtle and insinuating feelings which really make up the language of music. And related to the pedal, for instance, which is often used today to either sustain or let go. Down, up, down, up, down, and it's up. really always in you know. between. <laughs> and it should be always in between. Right, right. Fluctuating, fluttering, vibrating, vibrating, that the music is trembling always with life, with inner life. You know, so um, this is something one, one has to fight for, I believe. Music cannot be so simple and so categorical. Uh, if there's any art which goes over the edges and the boundaries and which is endless in its implications and associations, it's music. But this is the, 
the question, and it was the first uh, aesthetic proposition that Steuermann raised with me. I was a kid, didn't know what he was talking about. There were, there were two perspectives, unity and variety. And that became the clash of my conscience and musical thought ever since. And so it was a question of how much can you derive from the internal structure, the way it works itself out as a sequence of ideas and motives, but all of which in a self-referential language. Music alone right. is the name of the book, uh, Music Alone. You know? And how much of it is because the music has implications, associations, meanings, and Images. sometimes I've been getting back to the colors, list. Colors, colors. Right. Uh, getting back to the list. Thinking Touch, about, uh, taste, <laughs> all of these senses, all right, the exactly. fragrance, the pungency of the music. You yes. can't quite do that anymore. It's not permitted. Getting back to the, to the list, for instance, in a work like Rico Danza, which is everything is implied and nothing is said. And it has the, the tone of an old, a wonderful old uh, Valentine from a hundred years ago, with a little, there's a little aroma left, but it's not quite as potent as it was and everything. But it seems to me that there is a, there is something that with, in the glare of the microphone, it would be easy to, simply, it would evaporate. That this work, uh, I mean, I'm sure it comes through in, 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 in your recorded performance, but it must be very difficult to capture Yes, a, a dolce cantabile takes over and becomes a supreme. It becomes a category. This is the way it is taught. It is a desirable sound, and that is the sound. Buzoni, a, appropriate to your description, quote, a packet of yellowed love letters. Right. That's but, how we describe Ricardanza. So. Oh, really? I, uh, yes. Now, the yellowing, what does that mean? It means all of this fragrance which comes from aging. And it means the nostalgia, the mourning, the dream, the hope. All of these are insinuations which have to be manufactured somehow through the sound, through the touch. It, it, I always felt with that piece that there's a story there. There's a very specific story there, but we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about these 12 pieces of the Transcendental Etudes, 10, is it 10 of which have titles, and two don't. But how much do those titles, how, do they just set off your imagination? Do you, come, do you have in your mind an actual narrative for any of these pieces? Because there was, a, certainly in, in the late in the 19th century, there was this Mahler, for instance, talking about the, the first symphony. He said he had an elaborate program and he wasn't going to tell anyone what it was. Do you have programs? Actually, when I uh, made the first recording I did, I wrote a kind of exotic little prose poems attached to each one. They were just um, sort of shadows and ashes from the experience. They were not directives. I, I don't actually believe that. I just believe in the intimations and the way that, in the way that uh, Debussy wrote titles to the preludes after, after the preludes were <laughs> composed. And they are and published at the end of the piece, which I yeah. thought was a wonderful idea. Yes, that yes. You might, this may be what you were thinking of. Yes. But and, and the point is, you see, those kinds of associations are not um, to be uh, neglected or rejected. And there is a certain attitude, music alone, that these kinds of imagery are somehow foreign or fake or artificial or just sort of the f fancy and ego of the performer or the artist. And I think that is a loss. I really think that is a loss. I don't think that these two zones, the internal elaborations of the music as a sufficient language, and the love letters that are set off 
are rivals. Or rivals. But that's like the, but the, 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 the quote from Cezanne that, uh, about exactly what we're talking about. Yes. He said, when the colors are perfected, the form is finished. And suddenly, with that one stroke juxtaposing those two elements, he has combined and conflated these categories, which in classical thinking, the structure was a primary characteristic, the color a secondary. And what Cezanne understood and what I think Liszt understood, and many other composers, is that the color is a dimension of music. It's not just a superfluous add-on like salad dressing. Let's put a little color in there, you know. But the color of the sound is the pitch of the sound, and the two are bound, and inextricably bound. And, and that's the way uh, it should be performed. So I don't think there is this contradiction. And there, it's interesting. There, there's a wonderful quote from Ravel where he says, I have now finished the G major piano concerto. All I have to do is add the melodies. <laughs> <laughs> and so that in any f art form, anything can begin it. And anything can end. Yes, the flavor, the texture was all there. Right. And he just needed a couple of tunes. Right. And he which anybody could fill in, but which I'll, he, I'll do but, it. But he <laughs> came up with very good at the end, yes. Because the flavor and the texture were so inviting. They were so worked out. Yes, exactly. So um, I, I've, you know, it, it may seem a little heavy-handed. I, I apologize. But I remember as a kid, you know, these formative things you come across, you read. I saw a phrase in Carl Gustav Jung, who said, the mission of every artist is to estimate the character and fashion of the day, and then to work against that. Not to accept this prejudice, because at any given moment, the pendulum slides back and forth, and we are in a state that is somewhat distorted. And the state we are in, if you use the old dichotomy of Apollonian and Dionysian, is many times Apollonian performances, which are excellent, noble, direct, beautiful, a slight degree of anonymity. And there is a little danger of this quality of stylization and perfection leading to neutral performances. Performances that are accurate, perhaps ennobled, refined, cultivated. But Cezanne said, I'm not interested in any artist who does not have personality. And personality became questionable. A bit of a dirty word, right. a dirty word. You know, and uh, I think that's a, a pity. When I grew up, Steuermann said, "Rubinstein, great, but one is enough." You know, you do something else. You go in another direction, and um, teaching is like that. You know, each student has their own direction. You want to give them a push. And I think going back to the Apollonian and Dionysian thing, that. If you really go back to the aesthetics of the the beginning of that, each has to have a bit of the quality of the other. That that I think that there is almost no ex aesthetic excuse for the purely Apollonian and the purely Dionysian, exactly. and that the great performances may have a sort of a Dionysian extravagance, and yet at its at their core there may be a sort of the kind of severe one classical column quality of an Apollonian performance. And the same way with the other. I mean, the music writers are constantly uh, trying to uh, pin these two qualities on various pieces, and they always talk about the Beethoven Fourth Symphony being Apollonian and the Fifth Symphony being Dionysian. And yet, what makes each of those pieces interesting are the, their opposite qualities. 
And the mixture of them. And the mixture of them. And that's what where the personality is, because every person has both of those. Has a different mixture. And has both of those qualities right. in their... Uh, and, and reveals them in an unfolding way through the performance, leaving something unexpected. Beethoven said, next to love, surprises are the best thing in life. And music should have the possibility of surprise, risk, spontaneity, exactly. something unusual and unique. And if, if we hear that sometimes today, we feel, mm, that sounds wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, sounds I think wrong. one of the things I just love about hearing your performances is that knowing you're playing very well, I, I'm always saying, well, this is the way he'll play it, and, it's n and you never play it that way. That it always, because the this with all of the interest in the cult of personality the only real way of getting to your personality is just the cumulative effect of all of your performances because you are constantly reconsidering as far as the performance and the ingredients yes there is a vision and a conception and but there are two quotations from Ferd Wangler which I feel should be mentioned and really should be passed on to, to young students. One is in my book, his theory of interpretation. Quote, the music begins and then something happens. Something happens. Contingencies, accidents, incidents, events, and they propel a whole new chain of circumstances and beings which may or may not conform to the vision. In the end, I think they do, but you reach the goal in a different way. Then he also said, the improvisational quality is quite simply the ultimate source of all great necessary creative music making, the improvisational quality. And that's a little astonishing, actually, in a world which is so carefully made and fabricated the orchestral as our yeah. orchestral world with two rehearsals and where the boundaries have to be tightly set because you cannot afford these excursions, these digressions, which are the best thing in music, in art, and in life, the digressions, the surprises. It reminds me of a composer I know that said he gets great inspiration from hearing lousy performances of his pieces because they're so different than what he wrote that, that, that he gets a new piece out of it. I can understand. <laughs> and, and Brahms said when he heard two pianists, one and Clara, play very slowly, G minor Rhapsody, another very fast, bravo, bravo, and his friends said, but they're completely different. Do you think I like to hear my music always played in the same way. <laughs> so a composer should uh, t take pleasure and take joy in that. And we know some who don't, that you have a very right. prescriptive idea right. and this is the way it goes. But also pianists should take pleasure in that too. Yes, yes. Because um, you know, potency, potentiality, vitality, and life, it cannot be circumscribed. You, you can't put a lid on it. How do you get this across to your students who are living in a, in a first of all, in a, in a very different world, and that are in many of them in a conservatory where the, where the, there are some somewhat rigorous uh, boundaries? How how is uh, <laughs> how is that possible to get that across? You know, the, the, the worst reproach for Liszt with his students, there were three levels. One, they refused a little kiss on the cheek. The second, he said, très bien in French, meaning it was awful. And the third, <laughs> did you study this at a conservatory? <laughs> you know. uh, it depends on the student. Different strokes for different folks. Mm -hmm. But often it is just stirring up, stirring up, stirring up, because this binding impulse, particularly sort of sweating out, the ominous eye of judgment looking over you and saying, you missed a note. You know, as a teacher, it, it may sound petty or it may sound pretentious, I don't know. I always think of myself as a vocabulary teacher, just one who provides different terms, different sounds, different words, and different ideas 
to get somewhere, to go somewhere, because I think there have been studies which show in the language that young people use 25 percent of the vocabulary that they used 30 or 40 years ago. I also associate that with what I think is a devastating turn in education which has gone towards vocation. A hundred years ago, 80-90% of the students at college were liberal arts majors. Now it's like 5 or 10%. And the idea of education as growing out of one's bias and one's background and cursory prejudices. And growing out of the fear that is instilled in our lives that we're not that what what's going to, what's around the corner? What, what how are we going to live? And and I oh, I mean, yes. don't you find that with your students that there is is great fear time. of the future all the time, and it comes up constantly in conversation, and usually from very thoughtful and intelligent people. How many students? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? I reply with a certain pride and knowing it's a trick in a way. Joseph Campbell, they follow their bliss. What makes them happy? That is sufficient. From that they will improvise. They will find a way to spend a life in music. What could be more joyful and more wonderful to spend a life in music? To discourage those people and say, become, you don't have it, become right? a banker. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> But I, 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 and I, and you have uh, many generations of, of students have, have done just that. You have taken kids that were fearful and, and became, I mean, I, I am one of them, that, it, that became less fearful about the future. Because if you can instill that kind of intensity of what the musical experience is, it is irresistible. Well, I, I hope that's the case. But I cannot disagree with your term irresistible. There is an exhilaration, an intoxication, an ecstasy associated with just hearing music in one's head, in one's heart. It doesn't even mean you have to be playing it. You're dreaming it. You're walking. But to be surrounded always is to be lifted up. And like one of your favorite list pieces, Sursum Corda, I remember that you mm -hmm. that you loved that piece mm -hmm. very much, but you know we're making out a case for Liszt as the colorist. In these etudes, there are two un untitled. Number two, A minor. Number ten, F minor. They are comprised of extremely cryptic motives in the Beethoven style, and they are worked out with tremendous intelligence, intellect and presenting a narrative that's entirely based on these germs and these internal necessities and pressures. And they are of that quality that it is not shameful to compare them to Beethoven. He often did not compose in that way. He, he did not have enough time and he um, was affected, as you say, by these literary references. He used to read with his mistress um, every other day, Shakespeare, Dante, Goethe, Tasso. That was the prescription, every other day, alternate days. And he was suffused with that. But his conception of music and of art, symbolized by the Faust Symphony, the alchemist looking for wisdom, selling his soul, the eternal feminine, Gretchen, the demonic. This portrait of human nature is as wide and broad as is possible and is perfectly comparable with id, ego, and superego. Right. If you want to cover the whole spectrum of possibilities. So Liszt was a very informed person 
and sometimes carried away by these extraordinary was, uh, obligations. He was really willing to explore this very dark side to his character. I mean, that's the the interesting thing is just this the the yin and yang of of the 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 uh, taking holy orders and at the same time living at certain periods in his life just incredibly what would now be considered debauchery and carnality. I'm not quite sure it was as carnal and debauched as it's all set up to be. I mean... That could have been other people's I've fantasies. I've read those stories, <laughs> and the one kind of captivating evidence, he had a repertoire of 200 cravats, 200 ties. Well, that's pretty debauched, <laughs> I would say. But I know at least later in his life, um, he would get expensive cigars, hand them out, smoke the cheaper ones. He would never take first-class railway. At Lake Como, he would get up for four in the morning mass every day. And there was a certain austerity. He taught hundreds of students all his life. And was a zero busy payment, conductor and everything. Zero payment, never accepted a fee. List is sort of an interesting character in that his career really straddles a, a very uh, important time of history that he started as a young boy playing when romanticism was at its height. It was in its first bloom. And by the end of his career, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution was full force and the world had changed enormously. Uh, I think that, that his music reflects that change, don't you? And, and, and his not being very happy with the change. The worship of nature, the love of poetry, the yearning for the sublime, all of these were responses to the increasing grayness of the smokestacks and the rumbling of the trains and the functional architecture. And all of that represented the possibility of a world on the way to technology, which in the end would destroy Lake Como, the idyllic life of pursuit of beauty, majesty, dignity, kindness that was implicit in poetry and in religion. But, uh, you know, apart from that, these later pieces, they're very strange, aren't they, Craig? They are, and, and their they're musings on, uh, on, they're all about decline, I think, and they are about values that have gone astray, and they have a, they have a peculiar, they have a peculiar almost pessimism about them. And it, his early career was of tremendous optimism. Mm -hmm. Yes, d decay, decadence, yes. anomie, the amorphous, irresolute, no cadences, the mixture of whole tone chords and chromatic passages. He came much later, but, but Liszt would have really understood Proust. Yes. He would have understood that. Yes. But I see in that really a, a prophecy of the fragmentation of, of Beckett. You know? Yes. Of Kafka, the cringing of Kafka in looking at this bureaucratic world armed with the weapons of massive destruction that made the 20th century so bloody. And in these late pieces, one can hear the sigh of the future, what will happen to our world. And they're very touching, they're very beautiful. They're usually considered immature sketches or something like that. The ravings of a, an old man. I think uh, they are important statements and present us with the evidence if we could read backwards 
that could have warned us what was going to happen to this beautiful world and uh, how the tyrants would take over and leave us with only these sighs and these fragments so that somehow the greatest poetry and the greatest art were just murmurings, the murmurings, intimations, ravings. How can you respond? And as Adorno famously said after Auschwitz, there can be no poetry. I wanted to talk about one other aspect, which is something that we have not talked about either about Liszt, but also about you, is the sheerly athletic aspect of playing these really probably most difficult pieces of the 19th century. And the, the oddity of playing piano, which it is demanded of you that you are aesthetically advanced and that you are exploring the most subtle parts of the soul, but at the same time you are doing physical things that are extraordinarily athletic. Undeniably, undeniably. And are they ever at odds? Well, there's a whole uh, corpus of intensities that must coordinate, and it's not always available. I don't think there is a single project in life, certainly many more important things than playing the piano, but one which calls on so many different features of the personality, the head and the heart and the memory and the hand and the physical apparatus and the intelligence, all of these possible features of being human to, to become a pianist. Now I, growing up somewhat as a loner, and I kind of weaned off, never successfully, listening, watching to the ball games and dying to get out into Central Park and play baseball and watched over by my mother and practice and practice. But it is a passion and a source to me of coordination, of how people move, and the incredible um, artistic elegance of those movements. I mean, there are certain players just in the way that they use their limbs and their center of gravity and the way they move. It's uncanny. It's absolutely uncanny. And for me, this is high art, beautiful art. You know, it's not just the results. It is just, you know, it is related to dance in a way. And that was another formative experience of my life. So I've always told my students, if you want to play the piano, take dance lessons. Nobody followed that advice. But in my late teens, I used to, for summers, go to New London, Connecticut. The college there used to have a festival of modern dance, Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, the Doyen. I played for her. She did a choreography of the G major partita, Johann Sebastian Bach. Mm. I was astonished. Look at them, look at them moving. I thought Bach was medicine. You just had to take your medicine in order to grow up. And this was uh, intoxicating and beautiful and elegant. And suddenly all of these rhythms and the resilience and the lines and the branching out and the patterns of the music as seen by a great choreographer was very important to me. You know, and I, I have often thought Schumann used to say, I learned more about counterpoint from Jean Paul than from my music master. And I think I learned more about Bach from Doris Humphrey in playing for these dancers. But that was again another part of uh, physical coordination and, and the grace that is necessary. And liberating your body. Liberating yeah. one's body. I mean, th there are two kinds of technique. One is just a basic technique, being able to skillfully negotiate arpeggios, trills, octaves, and so on. 
I have a lot of students with a better basic technique than I have. The other is the technique of the hand following, the ear following the imagination and creating those qualities of sound which are unique and distinct to, to that moment and to that piece. And that is a different kind of technique, Greg, you know? I remember as vividly as if it, it were yesterday, many years ago, in David's Bundler Tensa, you, I was clawing at the piano, trying to get, the, get it to work. And you just said, your hand is like a lung and breathes like this. And just that metaphor liberated me to do the passage, but it was this wonderful folding in of, of certainly this kind of apparatus, the fingers apparatus, but it also inadvertently reminded me of the rest of my arm, the rest of my body, that my hands, not only my lungs breathe, but my hands breathe. Yes. And that it's, I, I just think that that, that was, a, uh, that was a, a watershed for me. That idea that that's not just a metaphor, that was folding in the rest of my body to, to my piano playing. Exemplified by the basic exercise of Martha Graham, which I observed, and she told her students, contract, release. It is this oscillation between these two states, mm -hmm. and one learns this recuperative ability. And, that it and that's what and keeps yeah. going, keeps yeah. one going. I, another example of that, and, and one that I uh, mention in my book, I think there is an unusual uh, resemblance between playing the piano and golf, because it's you against yourself, but the course is always changing, and the conditions, the acoustics, the mood, the moment, the piano, the action. But there's a certain Zen quality of, can you defeat the demon inside of you who is always anguished and raging, you know? And I watch the great golfers and watch the way they stand and stroke. I would say two things. One that I find astonishing, however famous, however many millions and billions, when they're 30 and 40 and 50, they go back to their teachers. Can you please mm -hmm. check my stroke? Can you please check my stroke? I don't know. Then the other thing is the strength they get from their legs, which was the claim of Jack Nicholas the greatest golfer, that all of his power came out of his legs. And in some way, this continuity of action generated from within, and then through the spine and through the hanging shoulders of Joe DiMaggio. Do you remember Joe DiMaggio? Yeah. The sloping shoulders was quite amazing. I mean, in a way, the very opposite of, you know, the tough Marine. Just these beautiful, graceful, sloping shoulders the energy pouring down through the arm and into the finger, and then back again, resilient, resonating, recuperating, and back and forth, this oscillation that you were talking about with the lung exhibit, you know. Satchel Page was a great black picture, and he said, never look behind you, something may be gaining on you. So I play, and I say, Thank you very much. <laughs> and I go off, and I go off, and I go off. <laughs> Ashkenazi said something very perceptive. Technique is rhythm. Technique is rhythm. The way you hear and calibrate the groupings of the notes and the internal punctuation and syntax that subdivides the notes is extremely important. We've had students, and my wife especially, who are just phenomenal in their execution. And I used to say about one of them, she hears 30-second notes in her 30-second note. She can subdivide a mm -hmm. 30-second note into 32 parts. That quality of rhythm. But it's not only just articulation. 
It's a way of grouping so that you have a moment to breathe, to breathe, to breathe. So that it's not just, it seems like a stream, but it's not really a stream. It's sort of like the story about Heifetz, who someone asked him, how do you play so well in tune? He said, I just slide faster than anyone else. <laughs> it's kind of the same idea. I mean, it really is about it, the oh, brain moving so that fast. Kemp was asked after the concert, Maestro, you don't make any mistakes. And he said, my dear, I don't practice them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't practice the mistakes. But it is a, a way of the brain regulating this headlong rush of propulsion and able still to keep reins on the horses. That's very essential. And it is a part of piano playing which is, I think, analogous directly to what Schubert said about Beethoven. The genius of Beethoven lay in that he composed at white heat in cold blood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. <laughs>